Colorado is one of the most scenic places in the United States, and one of the best ways to see Colorado is from on board a train. There are a number of interesting trains scattered around the state, from old narrow gauge railroads with steam locomotives to modern Amtrak luxury trains. So pull up a chair, grab a bag of popcorn, and enjoy the beautiful state of Colorado and the many interesting trains to be found here. Our first stop is the state capital of Denver. In the heart of downtown is the classic Union Station, where we'll board Amtrak's California Zephyr. The CZ is considered to be one of the world's premier train rides. A few miles west of Denver, the westbound train climbs the front range before diving under the Continental Divide at Moffat Tunnel. The Zephyr passes through several canyons in Colorado, and one of the most spectacular is Gore Canyon, where the train clings to a narrow shelf high above the raging Colorado River. The California Zephyr runs daily, year-round, and winter is a fabulous time to ride the train. Colorado has quite diverse scenery, from mountains to canyons to plains, and the Zephyr runs through them all. During winter weekends, there is another train that traverses part of this route, called the Ski Train.
the California Zephyr runs daily between Chicago and San Francisco. Get your tickets early. You'll be glad that you did. A few miles west of Union Station in Denver is our next stop in Golden. The Colorado Railroad Museum has an outstanding collection of railroad equipment that represents the history of Colorado railroading, as well as a large archival collection inside. Here, visitors can browse through displays depicting Colorado's rich railroading history. The outdoor displays showcase notable locomotives such as Burlington Route 5629 which is an example of a large steam locomotive, Rio Grande 5771, which is a 1950s era diesel, and Rio Grande number 491, which is a narrow gauge steam locomotive. Now during the course of this program, we'll be visiting several narrow gauge railroads. Narrow gauge track is closer together than the rails most of us see every day. Here we see a display of three rail track with the three foot wide narrow gauge running inside. One of the most famous narrow gauge railroads was the Rio Grande Southern, which was once located in southwestern Colorado. The RGS was famous for its fleet of motor cars called Galloping Geese. The railroad was chronically poor and built a fleet of gasoline powered motor cars with salvaged parts. Each was a little different. Goose 2 was built in 1931 using a Buick four-door sedan with passengers sitting in the auto body while Mail and Express rode in the compartment behind. Goose 7 was constructed in 1936 using a 1926 Pierce Arrow car body with a 1936 Ford V8 engine. Its freight compartment was later turned into tourist coach. Let's go. Let's take a ride on number seven around the museum grounds. a goose that was built somewhere in the early uh, 1930s that the Rio Grande Southern used uh, to take place of the steam locomotive. This was much cheaper to operate because they only had one motorman, uh, whereas a steam crew you had to have an uh, engineer, fireman, brakeman, and a conductor at least. These motor cars are an interesting bit of Colorado's colorful railroad history. The crown jewel of the museum is locomotive number 346, 
This narrow-gauge locomotive was built in 1881 for the Denver and Rio Grande and is operated all over Colorado. 346 still works and is run a few times a year for all to enjoy. Today, the 346 is borrowing the tender from Sister 318. If you're interested in Colorado history, the Colorado Railroad Museum should be high on your list of places to visit. Our next train ride to visit is located in South Central Colorado in the town of Canyon City. The Canyon City in Royal Gorge offers a 24 mile round trip to nearby Parkdale, passing through one of America's scenic treasures, the Royal Gorge. Passengers board at the old Santa Fe Railroad Depot in Canyon City and ride behind these streamlined diesels built in the 1950s and painted to resemble the Rio Grande Railroad diesels that once ran through the gorge. Construction on this line started in 1879 with two railroads, the Santa Fe and the Rio Grande, wanting to build through the Royal Gorge. The folly of this soon became apparent, as we'll see that there wasn't room for two railroads. After a fierce legal battle and a few gun battles, the Rio Grande Railroad was the winner of what became known as the Royal Gorge War. The Rio Grande Railroad quickly started promoting the scenic wonders of its Royal Gorge route, and people flocked to ride trains through here, with many riding special charters and everyone posed for the camera. Now look closely at this group of dapper looking gentlemen, for the man dressed in the top hat is President Theodore Roosevelt. Although passenger trains through the Royal Gorge ended in 1967, as late as 1997, one could see long trains of coal and iron ore passing through here until the freight traffic was rerouted. In 1999, new owners established the current tourist line, the first regular passenger trains in the gorge since 1967. Most trains back out of Canyon City and through the gorge, with the locomotives pulling on the return will ride the return trip so that you can see the view from the locomotive as well. <music> Leaving Parkdale, traveling eastbound, we see the Arkansas River to the south of the train 
The Arkansas is a favorite river for rafters, and we'll see quite a few along the way. One of the landmarks of the area is the suspension bridge that towers 1,053 feet above the river below. In this section, the railroad simply ran out of room. The builders resorted to a unique solution, a bridge that was suspended from girders built into the rock walls. This structure is called the hanging bridge. All too soon the ride comes to an end as we arrive back in Canyon City.
After you've ridden the Royal Gorge train, you'll want to visit the Royal Gorge Park and the famous suspension bridge. You can photograph the train from the bridge or ride the inclined railway down for close-up views of the river as well as the train. The Canyon City and Royal Gorge is a class act, a train that you don't want to miss. In Southwest Colorado is another of the world's famous train rides, the Durango and Silverton Narrow Gauge Railroad, which runs for 45 miles between its two namesake cities. Durango was founded by the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad in 1879, and the historic district preserves the old times. The centerpiece of the area is the railroad station, our gateway to a fantastic train ride. The Durango and Silverton uses narrow gauge equipment from the Rio Grande Railroad and mornings are a special time at the Roundhouse as the 1920-era steam locomotives are ready for the day's runs. Also at the Roundhouse is a museum where visitors can get up close to some of the railroad's historic equipment. Leaving Durango, the train runs alongside the Animas River, which we will follow all the way to Silverton. The railroad begins in a wide, flat valley, but we will soon start climbing up into the mountains. As the train climbs up out of the valley, passengers can look ahead for a glimpse of the scenery to come. One of the scenic highlights of the trip is when the train makes its way along the High Line, which is a narrow shelf over 400 feet above the raging river below.
After traversing the High Line, the railroad returns to river level and will follow the beautiful Animus all the way to Silverton with high peaks looming overhead. A particularly stunning part of the trip is the section north of Needleton Siding, where passengers can gaze at several peaks over 13,000 feet high in the Grenadier Range. Silverton is an old Colorado mining town and is an interesting place to visit in its own right. Miners once hauled out silver by the ton, thus the town's name and the reason for the railroad to be here. The Durango in Silverton is one of Colorado's most revered historical and scenic attractions something that you just have to experience for yourself. Returning to South Central Colorado, we are in the village of Manitou Springs, which is just outside of Colorado Springs. The Manitou and Pikes Peak Cog Railway takes guests to the very top of the world, the summit of Pikes Peak. Manitou Springs is at an elevation of 6,570 feet above sea level, while the top of the mountain is at 14,110 feet, making this the highest railroad in the world and the one with the greatest elevation gain. Opened in 1890, this railroad is different from the others that we will visit as it is a cog railroad. As we can see by this retired steam cog locomotive, cog trains get their traction from a cog on the train turning into a rack on the ground. Okay, Drew, we have a high ball. The Pikes Peak Cog Railway uses diesel rail cars built in Switzerland, where cog railways are much more common than in North America. Departing the depot in Manitou Springs, 
we immediately plunge into the forest and start climbing up the mountain. The steepness of the track is very apparent. The maximum grade on this railroad is 25%, which means that the track climbs 25 feet up for every 100 feet that it goes forward. By comparison, the steepest grade that any other train in this program will encounter is 4%. We're now above the tree line and the views become spectacular. We're high enough to see the San Juan Mountains in western Colorado, yet we just keep going up and up and up. We've reached the summit of Pikes Peak, and passengers have a chance to get off and enjoy the view. During our visit, this took some doing as the wind was really whipping around, but this happens. After all, we're at the top of the world. As is the case with many of the trains in this program, the Pikes Peak Cog Railway is one of the best train rides in the entire world, so start planning your Colorado vacation now. Railroading in Colorado is not limited to trains running through the mountains. In the northern Colorado city of Fort Collins, the restored Fort Collins Municipal Railway offers a three-mile round trip along original right-of-way down Mountain Avenue. Let's hop aboard here at Howe Street and take the streetcar to the stop at City Park. 
We're riding aboard car number 21, which was built in 1919 by the Bernie Company. Car 21 served its entire career here in Fort Collins and ran this route daily until the streetcar service ended in 1951. The streetcar was then put on display next to the city museum, where it deteriorated until restoration by volunteers began in 1977. The streetcar line was torn up in 1951, but the segment that we are traveling over was replaced starting in 1980. Car 21 is very much at home here as it passed all of these houses while in regular service. Although most people take the streetcar for the fun of it all, some people actually use it as transportation, taking it to the local supermarket. Unlike regular railroad trains, car 21 has to obey traffic signals just like automobiles do. At the west end of the line, we turn off of Mountain Avenue to make our stop in City Park. In this age of hustle bustle, many people fondly remember a slower, more genteel time, something that can still be experienced here in Fort Collins. Traveling south again to Denver, we see a modern version of what we just rode in Fort Collins. Denver's RTD transit system includes a light rail system which had 14 miles in service when this program was produced. 
Opened in 1994, the light rail system runs with modern electric trains that can hold 125 passengers. With a cruising speed of 50 miles an hour, one can zip to and from downtown with ease. Let's take a spin on this modern, comfortable transit alternative. Next time that you're in Denver, check out the RTD's light rail system. It might just take you where you want to go. From Denver, we travel west 45 minutes into the mountains to the old Victorian mining town of Georgetown and yet another unique train ride. The Georgetown Loop Railroad is a narrow-gauge railroad operating over a restored portion of the old Colorado and Southern narrow-gauge lines between Georgetown and adjacent Silver Plume. Pulling our train is engine number 12, which is a Shea steam locomotive. Shays get their power from turning a crankshaft instead of directly driving the wheels. Number 12 was built in 1926. It once hauled timber products in California before coming to Colorado. Departing Georgetown, we pass under the Devil's Gate Viaduct, which we will incredibly cross in just a few minutes. Making a guest appearance for one scene is engine number 40, built in 1920 which was making a test run prior to being leased to Alaska's White Pass and Yukon Railroad. The railroad you're riding today is a reconstructed part of the old Georgetown, Breckenridge, and Leadville Railroad. For those of you not familiar with the story of the loop, it was the surveyor's answer to the problem of getting the railroad from Georgetown to Silver Plume. You see, the two towns are only two air miles apart, but they differ in elevation by over 600 feet. Had the track been laid straight up the floor of the valley, the grade would have been in excess of 6%, far too steep for normal railroad operating. To get away from this, surveyors laid out a route that doubled back and looped over itself.
This allowed the average grade to be held to 3.5%, although it increased the distance from the old Georgetown station to Silver Plume to about 4.5 miles. The early residents of the area had called the narrow mouth of the canyon the Devil's Gate, so when they built the bridge, it naturally became the Devil's Gate Viaduct. The bridge is 300 feet long and has an 18 and a half degree curve on it. Though it might look flat and level from here, it is built on a 2% grade. The original bridge was removed in 1939. This replica was built by the Colorado Historical Society in 1973 and visually duplicates the original, although it is much sturdier. Our train is crossing over Clear Creek and the railroad tracks that we were on only minutes ago. The railroad has made a complete circle and is now looping over itself, something seen all the time in model railroads, but amazingly, this is real. was only a short stub end branch line from Denver, but the railroad was very profitable in the early days, bringing the mining families and supplies to the mountain communities and taking the rich ore back to the Golden and Denver area to be processed. This continued until the Silver Panic of 1893, when the price of silver dropped to unprofitable levels. At that time, tourism took over as the main source of revenue for the railroad. Heavy tourism continued on into the early 1900s. However, as highways were improved and more dependable automobiles were built, people began to turn to their private cars and trucks for their business and pleasure travel in the mountains, rather than taking the train. The passenger business dwindled, and in 1927, the railroad discontinued passenger service. It still ran two or three freight trains a week until the late 1930s, when there was so little business that the railroad filed to abandon the line. Their petition was granted, and in 1939, the rails and bridges from Silver Bloom east to Idaho Springs were taken up and sold for scrap. Society felt this history should be preserved. The society began to rebuild the railroad starting in Silver Bloom in 1973. By 1975, we were able to operate our first passenger trains, and we have run every year since then. In 1984, the new high bridge was completed, and the track and facilities below the bridge were complete in time for the 1985 season. As we round this next curve, we'll be passing a spur track called Morning Star. And sitting on Morning Star is old locomotive number nine. This engine was built in 1884 and saw service on the Georgetown Loop over 100 years ago. It is now owned by the Colorado Historical Society, and we hope someday we'll have the funds to restore number nine to its original condition. We are arriving in Silver Plume and the western end of today's restored railroad. Also part of the Georgetown Loop experience is the tour of the Lebanon Silver Mine, which is adjacent to the line. Colorado was once covered with silver mines and the railroads that serve them. The Georgetown Loop Railroad does a good job of bringing the old times to life for today's visitors to experience for themselves. Another old mining town is Cripple Creek which is located in the south-central part of the state. 
gold was discovered here in 1890, and the town still mines for gold in the pockets of visitors who visit the casinos located here. The Cripple Creek and Victor Narrow Gauge Railroad offers a four-mile round trip that offers views of Cripple Creek as well as many mines in the area. Our locomotive, number two, was built in Germany and first worked in a stone quarry. Departing Cribble Creek, we pass the old Midland Terminal Depot, which is now a museum. The Midland Terminal was a standard gauge railroad, which arrived here from the north in 1895 to tap the riches of the area. The gold rush ended, and the Midland Terminal was abandoned in 1949. If the rails look like they're close together, it's because they are. Today's railroad was built to a two-foot gauge with rails only two feet apart. Although this track width never caught on, there were several two-foot railroads scattered about the world, and some of this equipment has found a home here. Although not a long ride, our train does pass through some lovely Colorado scenery. At the end of the line, the train pauses near the closed Anaconda and Mary McKinney mines to give passengers a glimpse back to the boom times of the region, when gold was king. The Midland Terminal may be long gone, but some of its spirit lives on in today's Cripple Creek and Victor. Moving to the southeastern part of the state, Amtrak's Southwest Chief is roaring through Los Animas. The Chief runs daily between Chicago and Los Angeles and cuts through the Great Plains of eastern Colorado before climbing over rugged Raton Pass.
After passing through the southern Colorado city of Trinidad, the Southwest Chief leaves the plains behind as we climb over Raton Pass. One of the amenities that the chief shares with the California Zephyr is that each train has a glass-walled sightseeing car where guests can enjoy the Colorado scenery passing by their windows. Near the summit of the pass, the grade stiffens to 3%, which is quite steep for a mainline train. Also near the summit, we pass by the famous Wooten Ranch with the old Santa Fe Trail running through it. Just before our train reaches the top of 7,588 foot Raton Pass at the tunnel, we'll cross the boundary marker and pass into New Mexico. We'll leave the Southwest Chief here and let it continue on its way to Los Angeles. Returning one final time to Denver, we're climbing aboard the Platte Valley Trolley. Departing across the river from downtown Denver, the trolley takes passengers for a ride along the river and down part of the old trolley line to Golden. Vintage replica uh, trolley. It was actually built in 1986 by the Gameco Trolley Company out of Ida Grove, Iowa. It's patterned after cars that were used in Denver and other cities around the turn of the century. <clears throat> it's a uh, it's a real design. The original to it is in Brantford at the uh, Railroad Museum or at the Trolley Museum in Brantford, Connecticut. We basically offer uh, two types of rides. One is tourist rides and up and down along the South Platte River, uh, show people the scenery. We go through many of the old areas of Denver. Uh, this is one of the areas where Denver was founded in 1858. Uh, we also offer a transit service to uh, Bronco football games. We, we run a shuttle service during Bronco games uh, from one end of our line down to the uh, stadium. Most people like the, like the trolley ride. They, they bring their kids down. Uh, 
seniors come down to ride the trip. We have Elitch Gardens Amusement Park across the river from us. Uh, they have moved out from their old location, which is at, there used to be at 38th and Tennyson. They opened a new park down here, and they included a water world in it. Uh, on this side of the river, we've always had Children's Museum down here. We've uh, since added last year uh, the opening of uh, Colorado's Ocean Journey, the aquarium project here. And we've also opened up the, or they have also opened up Recreational Equipment Incorporated, who took over the old Forney Museum, the Forney Transportation Museum, and turned it into a sporting goods superstore. And they are attracting a ton of people, a ton of tourists, plus their own shoppers. We get a lot of good reaction from people that they see us because they, they're coming down to visit Ocean Journey. They see us during football games. They see us from the amusement park across the river. Uh, now they see us from Recreational Equipment Incorporated's building. Uh, they ride the bike path. Uh, they, they, they think it's a neat thing to have, a, to have an old trolley running around town and they jump on it and ride. Like the other trolley operations that we have visited, the Platte Valley Trolley makes stops along the way, which passengers can use to visit nearby attractions. Uh, let's go this one, okay? During our visit, the ride was cut short due to nearby highway construction that had the line blocked. Normally, the ride continues on through other Denver neighborhoods and includes a section of the old trolley line to Golden. If you're in Denver and looking for a relaxing way to spend an afternoon, then make sure you check out the Platte Valley Trolley. far southern part of the state in the small town of Antonito is another railroad that can be listed among the world's finest train rides. The Cumbres and Toltec Scenic Railroad runs trains along 64 miles of narrow gauge track between here and Chama, New Mexico. Antonito is a small farming community located in Colorado's San Luis Valley. Departing Antonito, the train traverses an area that looks straight out of the Wild West. This part of the line has in fact served as the backdrop for several Western movies. Cumbres and Toltec was built in 1880 
as part of the Denver and Rio Grande's extensive narrow gauge system. Until the last Rio Grande train ran through here in December of 1968, this railroad and the line between Durango and Silverton were part of the same route. If the locomotives on the Cumbres and Toltec look similar to the ones on the Durango and Silverton, it is because most of them are sisters. Every engine that is now in Durango passed through here, and every locomotive on the Cumbres and Toltec once ran into Durango. In 1970, the states of Colorado and New Mexico bought the part of the line between Antonito and Chama to save as a living history museum and tourist attraction. The rest of the railroad between Chama and Durango wasn't so lucky and was torn up. In the first 15 miles out of Antonito, the train has left the San Luis Valley behind and is now in an area with lots of ponderosa pine and aspen. Our train is steadily climbing. Antonito is at an elevation of 7,888 feet above sea level, but will soon crest 10,000 feet at Colorado's Cumbres Pass. At the ghost town of Sublet, New Mexico, our train stops for water. Now you may be wondering why we are showing scenes outside of Colorado. The railroad crosses the boundary between Colorado and New Mexico 11 times. Thus, the New Mexico portions of the line will be included in this program as they are all part of the same train ride. Well, the Cumberson Toltec is 64 miles long. And uh, of those 64 miles, it's almost split equally between the two states of Colorado and New Mexico. And uh, it's interesting that when you depart Antonito, Colorado, you spend more railroad miles in New Mexico, you depart Chama, New Mexico, and you spend more railroad miles in Colorado, and you meet in Colorado. So it's just uh, intertwined between the two states. And so it was a natural for the states of Colorado and New Mexico to buy this railroad. Leaving Sublet, the railroad passes above the beautiful Los Pinos Valley. We're approaching Rock Tunnel. Upon exiting the tunnel, we'll look down several hundred feet into the rugged Toltec Gorge.
After a brief lunch stop at the ghost town of Osier, Colorado, the railroad continues climbing toward Cumbres Pass. Our train has arrived at 10,000 foot Cumbres Pass, which means summits in Spanish. From here, we'll go 14 miles west to watch the train from Chama. Chama, New Mexico is at the western end of the railroad. Located here are many railroad structures from the 1920s and before. I believe this is a particularly useful uh, railroad historically because we have more of the, both the, the history, the equipment and the buildings left on this railroad than any other railroad that I can think of. And it's so important as a part of Colorado history that we have these essential elements and they've been preserved. And it was a fluke that it was preserved because uh, time sort of passed this railroad by and just didn't get developed in the same way that the other ones did. They kept using it, they find another excuse to keep using the railroad, but then they just uh, uh, never got around to improving it like everything else. And so we have the buildings that were still here uh, that, that are really a great representation of the history of this 120-year-old uh, rail line. The climb up from Chama to Cumbres is one of the great spectacles in steam railroading. The 12 miles of 4% grade that often requires two steam locomotives to pull the train. The train crosses into Colorado at the water station at Cresco. Not every train stops here, but when they do, it's a treat to watch the full throttle departure. We're approaching Cumbres Pass once again. Being 64 miles long, the Cumbres and Toltec offers a variety of travel options 
and allow visitors to take all or part of the trip. Do yourself a favor and plan to spend the day at this fantastic steam railroad. Our next stop is in central Colorado at the old mining town of Leadville. The Leadville, Colorado and Southern takes passengers on a 22 mile round trip along a portion of the old Denver South Park and Pacific, which later became a part of the Colorado and Southern. Steam locomotive number 641 is on display as a reminder of the CNS days. The train departs Leadville caboose first, with the locomotive pulling on the return trip. After leaving Leadville, our train enters a forest of aspen and pine. We're on one of the first trips of the season, thus there are a few empty seats on the train. Ever since it was built, this railroad has been called the High Line, a name that is easy to see as we cling to a narrow shelf high above the valley below. This railroad was originally built as a narrow gauge line. It was opened in 1884 by the Denver South Park and Pacific Railroad. Constructed to tap the riches of the many mines in the area, it continued hauling ore until the last mine along the line closed back in 1986. The line was purchased by the current owners the next year in 1987, and they've been running excursion trains since 1988. At Bird's Eye, we round a 20 degree curve, which is much sharper than is usually found on a standard gauge railroad. French Gulch, we come upon another reminder of the steam era, an old steam locomotive water tank. As was mentioned earlier, this railroad was built in narrow gauge in 1884, an operation that lasted until 1943. At that time, the railroad was widened to standard gauge to allow for easier and faster shipment of ore from the mines. This area was once a railroad center. On the other side of the valley is the abandoned grade of a Denver and Rio Grande narrow gauge line. Also running into the area was the Colorado Midland. The mineral riches of the region were irresistible to railroad executives, but alas, the mining has played out and the railroads are now gone. As we near the summit of Fremont Pass, our ride comes to an end at an elevation of 11,120 feet. When the railroad was narrow gauge, one could continue all the way to Denver. The Leadville, Colorado and Southern is yet another reason to come to Colorado and ride a train.
for our last railroad, we'll travel to southwestern Colorado and the town of South Fork to visit Colorado's newest railroad. The Denver and Rio Grande Railway resurrected both an old name and an old railroad line. Shortly before our visit, the D and RG purchased the out-of-service railroad between here and the old mining town of Creed. Although not get ready to haul passengers, indeed the crew is still digging out the railroad. Hence, we're including this speeder car segment that you can look forward to another Colorado railroading experience. Eventually, the DNRG hopes to offer train rides behind a steam locomotive. To our right is the Rio Grande River, the very same river that makes up some of the border between the U.S. and Mexico several hundred miles downstream. One of the reasons for establishing the modern tourist trains is the variety of scenery to be found in the shore 24 miles between South Fork and Creed. The area around the old depot at Wagon Wheel Gap has long entranced visitors to the region with the high cliffs towering overhead. In fact, the DNRG once had a resort here with which it entertained investors and other important guests. The destination for the original Denver and Rio Grande was indeed Mexico, but for a variety of reasons, the DNRG ended up with railroad lines to mining towns all over Colorado. The railroad had last been used in the 1980s, and in places it is hard to tell that a railroad ever ran here. Construction on this segment of the DNRG began in 1882, but Creed wasn't reached until 1891. Past Wagon Wheel Gap, the valley widens for the last few miles to Creed. Our trip was the first railroad movement into the city limits of Creed since 1985. But we didn't quite make it into town, as the railroad still needed some work here. The railroad's eventual destination is the old mining town of Creed. Thousands of people visit here every year to walk around town, attend plays at the famous theater, or visit the old mines. Hopefully in the future the roads will be a little emptier as some of these folks will be arriving by train. Colorado is a state with diverse, lovely scenery. The next time that you're in Colorado sightseeing, why not leave your car at the railroad depot? and see Colorado the way that it is best seen, through the window of a train.